Just doing a sound check for those of you online. If you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. How's the sound? Great. Thanks for the feedback. We'll be getting started probably in about four or five minutes. Well, welcome back everyone, those of you in the room here tonight and those of you online. This is week three of our introduction to mindfulness meditation. And um, as I said, maybe you remember, some of you maybe weren't here the first night, but the truly, I think, fair to say, truly astounding thing 
for us human beings is that all lifelong we have a mind, we have this sensitive heart. And we've been so busy <clears throat> with this external orientation and all our thoughts and reactions to what we see and hear and think that we've had very little actual interest in the mind itself. I mean, we might read books about the mind, but actually like we can do right now, we can realize right now and do this with me, if you would, we can realize there's a knowing mind right here, right? There's a sensitive heart. And we're not trying to fix or make anything happen, but we're just aware of the nature, the subjective nature of our mind, our heart, right here and now. And you could say, as we do in sort of the Buddhist tradition, being aware of the present moment, being aware of the way it is, here and now. But when we're lost in thought, I'm at common ground, then we're very in a very real sense we're disconnected from our subjective experiencing that awareness that this is being known or the awareness that this is happening this is being felt so what we're doing in these six weeks is <clears throat> it's you know for some of you you know you've been practicing for a while but for those of you who are new, we're really talking about a shift in allegiance or a, a different lifestyle, really, where instead of, you know, all the time orienting around what we would call external, which is still here and now in the present moment, of course, but our thoughts about things, we're really training the mind to value this present moment awareness. Oh, it's like this now. So we're in the middle of the course. So by this point, we want, we should all have some competence. At the very least, we have to have some interest. And then out of that interest will come some competence of how to recognize the present moment. Oh, it's like this now. It's like this now. This experience is being known. So in Buddhist terms, I know it sounds a little funny to say this. We say, this is a moment, like my subjective experience right now is a moment of mind because the present moment right now for each of us is being known here. And here is another way of saying in the mind or in the heart. When I think it's out there, my experience, like I see you, I hear the sound of the furnace blowing, the blower on the furnace, I see the light. But all that is being known here in the sensitive heart and the sensitive mind. This is a moment of the mind knowing. One of my teachers has a wonderful little book. It's freely available online, but I love the title. Now is the knowing. You know, it sounds a little enigmatic, but it's, it's, it's really true. Now, like the now of the present moment, what really characterizes the now of the present moment is that it's being known here and now. Life, experience, it's always something being known here and now. And this is what we miss because we're mostly caught up in our thoughts about things. Now, if this, what I said, doesn't make sense, that's okay. But at some point it will start to make sense what I'm pointing to with the words that I've just said. And then you'll know that you're getting some competence, a new skill, which allows you to recognize, allows the mind to recognize the present moment, which mostly as we live our life goes unrecognized. Even though if we interviewed people on the street, everyone's going to say, of course, I'm aware of the present moment. But that doesn't mean they're aware of the thought that I know the present moment or that I'm aware of the present moment. But to recognize now is the knowing, the nowness, 
that's a relatively rare thing. And when we get a sense of its value, then we realize how much it's not our habit. When we really want it to become the habit of the mind, that present moment awareness, then only then do we realize that is definitely not my habit. And it's definitely not the culture's habit. The culture's habit and most of our habits is to be distracted, to be lost in thought and to be oblivious to, oh, this is an experience being known here and now. It's like this now. So when we go through the meditation tonight, uh, we're going to go through um, around nine, not that you have to remember this, but nine or 10 steps of the most uh, comprehensive meditation instructions the Buddha gave. Uh, and it's under this general category of mindfulness of breathing. But you'll see though, even though we begin with this attentiveness to the physicality of breathing in and breathing out, and even though we'll go back to that over and over again to just have that <clears throat> relatively concrete experience of you know breathing in and feeling that rising of the belly or feeling that touching at the nostrils when the air comes in. We're really, even though we, we begin with this sort of exclusive attentiveness to the physicality of breathing in and breathing out, it's just a means to become more and more present to the conditions that are being known. And we slowly will make a transition. We'll still always be aware of the breathing rhythm, breathing in, breathing out, but it would eventually we'll go into more of the background of the attention and aspects of the mind itself, qualities of the mind itself will come more into the foreground. So, I'll walk us through that, but it's, it really makes this point that even though we begin and we need to get comfortable with, it's like a particular mental muscle we want to develop, which is this capacity to bring our attention to something ordinary, like breathing in and breathing out, and just hang out with that, stay aware of that. And it, in a way, you know, I think it's even related to our, how evolution has trained our attention to kind of always be looking for the next saber tooth tiger or the, the next attractive person that, or the next dangerous person or the next delicious thing to eat, right? One of my teachers said once, you know, all we care about is can I eat it? Can I mate with it? Or will it eat me? <laughs> And everything else we tend to ignore. But even though that's built in, the mind can be trained, the heart can be trained to be attentive to something that's ordinary. And like when I'm really trained my mind to be with something ordinary, like just breathing in from the beginning of the in-breath to the end, that means I'm taking my attention off of can I mate with it? Can I eat it? Will it eat me? It's, it's not a small thing to be attentive to something simple and ordinary with a, a fullness of attention, an unwavering presence, because it means that that survival instinct, that you know, hypervigilant survival instinct, looking for threats, looking for things we desire, that means that where it's a counter program to that. And I'm just gonna be with this. Same like when we go to bed at night, if we don't shut off, if we don't, if we can't connect from that hyper vigilance, we'll keep thinking about the threats in our life. We'll keep thinking about the things that we're really excited about in our life and we won't get any sleep. We have to let all that die. And that same sort of death, just to be a little provocative, has to happen when we meditate. For this 20 minutes, you know, when you set your alarm, just realize I should probably record this. When you set your alarm for the amount of time you're gonna sit, you're basically saying to yourself for this period of time, I don't have to be aware of all the other things that are coming and going in my field of experience. It can be there in the background, but I don't have to, I can, 
I don't have to be looking. I can just be in this profound receptivity. And initially, to get there, we train with something that we would call an exclusive meditation object. And I think I mentioned this either week one or two, because there's also the open, the openness of meditation where whatever's predominant is what the mind is aware of. But in a way that's a harder training. So generally to train, we first take up something specific or exclusive. I'm just gonna be with the breath. I'm just gonna be with the sensations of the sitting body. I'm just gonna be aware of hearing. Because in a way, the first most challenging thing about developing a meditation practice is learning this capacity to put everything else down. I don't have to think about that now. I don't have to plan that. I don't have to problem solve that. I could fantasize about that, but I don't need to fantasize about that now. All of that, and every time that off ramp appears in my mind to go there, wisdom can say, you could do that, but you don't need to do that. Why don't you just stick with your meditation object for now and see what good comes from that. See if the Buddha knew what he was talking about. And if something good comes from learning, it's not that the meditation object is special. What's special is not taking any of the off ramps because that is such a deep habit of our mind to do whatever it wants to do. So if we want to fantasize about this or plan that or recurgitate the past or whatever else, mind basically runs the show, that aspect of the mind, that kind of habit-based aspect of the mind gets to call the shots. And all of a sudden now we're taking up a training kind, but also a persistent training that says, honey, we're not gonna do that now. We're doing this now. So we're gonna connect and sustain attention with the present moment, ordinary reality of what does it feel like when the belly rises with the in-breath? What does it feel like when the abdomen contracts a little with the out-breath? Or what does it feel like when the air comes in through the nostrils? Or what does the air feel, you know, that touching? Something as ordinary as the air touching the skin around the nostrils, or something as ordinary as that movement of the abdominal wall as it rises and falls or however you feel the physicality of breathing in and breathing out, because it isn't about the rising and falling of the abdominal wall being special or the touching sensations at the nostrils. They're not special, they're ordinary. That's the point. Can we train attention to be attentive to something that's ordinary? And can we cultivate a fullness an unwavering attention, so much so that the heart, the mind puts everything else down for a while. Everything. And you know how we know when we've done that? We begin to feel the lightness of the mind not caught up with all the other stuff we normally, the mind is normally caught up with. Because it's only knowing this one thing to some degree, right? And then that feels good. And in Buddhism, we call that seclusion. And that's how you know you're getting this first training, which is we're using an exclusive meditation object. And in, often in early Buddhism, this lineage of Buddhism that we teach here at the center, we use really earthy things like the breath, hearing, the experience of the body sitting, even specific touch points like feeling the sits bone, touching the chair or the cushion or feeling your hands touching or feeling your lips touching and just moving through the body, these different touch points, but it's ordinary stuff, which is surprisingly hard because the way, again, through evolution, the attention is much more interested in dramatic stuff, sudden movement, <laughs> strange sound, right? That's what gets a scary thought. That's what gets the attention. So to train the attention to connect, to sustain, 
to keep sustaining and to be actually interested and relaxed. Like not interested in controlling what we're interested in, but interested and at the same time, hands off, just letting the breath be or letting the sensations of the body be or letting sounds be. That's a real training. So we'll do that for the first part of the set. And then the last half or so, we'll move beyond that. So we'll start opening up the field of awareness from this exclusive attention to the breath. We'll move to more open attention to the whole body. And then from the whole body to the sense of calm. From the sense of calm to the to now starting to notice the space of the mind. So not so much what the mind is knowing, but what is the quality of the mind that's knowing? Oh, it's light, it's bright. There's actually a little joy there, a little lightness. Oh, there's some ease in the mind and heart. Oh, there's some dispassion, just letting things be. Oh, look at that, the mind's actually a little bit more quiet. Ah, there's a space of the present moment. So there are these different aspects of the mind. We're still aware of breathing in and breathing out, but we're more, that's more in the background. And in the foreground is basically looking at the mind that is aware of the present moment. We're looking at the knowing mind. And this is newer territory for most of us. Any questions about that before we do a little stretch and uh, maybe I'll talk briefly about walking meditation, and then we'll do about a half an hour sit. But anything come up from what I said, either from those of you online, you can just raise your digital hand or people in the room here. And there will be time for discussion and questions after the guided meditation. Any questions from the folks online? Anybody in the room? Good, well, maybe I'll talk. Now I did mention walking meditation last week and the Buddha taught that we should train with four postures. So this week, even though the main practice will be somehow in your busy lives, finding 20 minutes better is 30 minutes, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes is better than no minutes but every day, a little time. And if that means you have to put a note on your dresser next to your bed, or so even if it's the end of the day and you haven't practiced, do some practice right then, even if it's just for a few minutes. But I, this next week, I encourage you to practice with the th three other postures, to do some walking, to do some standing, and to do some lying down practice. Because you want to see, you don't want to equate meditation with just the formal sitting posture, whether you're on the floor or sitting on a chair. You want to see it's really the work of the mind. And the posture is just, there are advantages and disadvantages for different postures. Walking in is a good posture when there's a lot of restlessness or sleepiness. Standing is good when there's a lot of sleepiness. Lying down is good when there's a lot of physical pain. Because when there's a lot of physical pain or emotional pain, you're not going to fall asleep generally when you're lying down. And sitting is generally the best all around posture because it, for most people, most of the time, it provides enough encouragement for alertness, especially like you can't see online, but you know, I'm not really leaning against the back of the chair. The upper part of my buttocks is touching, but my upper back isn't touching. So but it takes some uh, effort to stay upright, but it really supports alertness. But for some of us, it's going to be more comfortable than sitting cross leg because we don't have the flexibility in our hips. And so I, I can actually be alert and relaxed in this posture. So the question for all of you at home and all of you in the room is, is the posture you have now an appropriate posture to be both alert and relaxed. So take a little time, stretch, 
And then just as if for the first time, really be curious, what do you need to do to be relatively alert and relatively relaxed? How can your posture support you in that? A lot of us can have some spiritual pride, you know, like, oh, I've got to sit this way. Jen, did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Could you just talk a little bit about um, setting an intention before a sit? I always forget to, and then I think I'm supposed to, and then I get confused about uh, well, my intention is to be aware of the present moment, end of story. But anyway, just curious. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really important point. And, and maybe we'll come back to it after the sit, but I'll, I'll mention something when we start. But let me just say something briefly now. In the Buddha's understanding, intention is what makes everything happen. It's the most important thing. And because it's subtle, the intentions in our mind are subtle. They're there, but we tend not to notice them. And uh, so initially it will feel somewhat artificial to consciously set your intention at the beginning of a meditation time. But I still recommend that you try to do that. So if you finished stretching and moving, why don't you come into a comfortable upright sitting posture as best as makes sense for you tonight. And we'll just reflect together about the intention for our practice once you get settled, but take some time. And you might even wanna take a couple of longer, deeper breaths where you fill and then empty the lungs and really take your time. You don't have to rush and use that easy deep breathing just as a way to come more fully into the body, into the present moment. Maybe one more of those longer, deeper breaths in and out and eventually letting the breath continue on its own, not needing it to be any particular way. And it's good <clears throat> to connect with this most, <clears throat> excuse me, trustworthy emotion that we could call something like self-compassion. And you might even want to silently repeat to yourself with whatever sincerity is available, I care about this life. And feel free just to put it in your own way. I really do care about this life. Care enough now to be close to listen well, to feel what's here to feel. I care enough about my life to not be distant or disconnected. And I care enough to learn in the deepest way how to take care of this life. So you can see how that self-compassion and just reflecting in a way that is sincere that works for you brings us to the wholesome intention that's so trustworthy i'm really here my intention behind my meditation is to really learn something about how to best take care of this life and related to our deep Trustworthy intention is just the sense of humility. If I already had a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding, 
how to take care of this life, then I'd probably would need to be doing what I'm doing. But there's this sense, this sincere sense, there's more to learn. There's aspects of this life, this heart and mind that I don't yet understand. The causes for stress, the causes for release. I'm not totally competent. So I'm here to listen, I'm here to learn. I'm here to realize what I haven't seen before, see what I haven't seen before about the mind, about the causes for stress and the causes for release. So with that wholesome intention established now, I'm gonna begin cultivating this exclusive attention to the physicality of breathing in and breathing out. And I know it won't be easy, but I'm just gonna do the best I can. Starting by just realizing this experience of the body sitting is being known, being felt. And right here in the experience of the body is the movement of the breath coming in and the sensations of the breath as it goes out. And it's not about controlling the breathing process. Any breath will do. So we just trust the body to breathe. But we're intending to be intimate with the physicality of breathing in from the beginning of the in-breath to the end. And from the beginning of the out-breath to the end just tracking the ordinary process of breathing in and breathing out, wherever that's easy for you to connect with, maybe in the belly as the rise and fall, maybe around the nostrils as a touching, you can just choose. And see if it's possible to be attending to the in-breath and the out-breath without needing to control, without getting tight, so relaxed and alert. And you can notice a simple pleasure that comes from the simplicity and the mind being secluded from its ordinary worries and planning and wondering and thinking this and that. And instead there's just a simple sensitivity to the in-breath and experiencing the out-breath just as it is. And letting everything else fall away far into the background.
and be willing to begin again and again and be really happy just with one in breath and tracking or that unwavering simple presence, keeping it in mind. And if you need an additional support, you can repeat a simple phrase like breathing in, experiencing the breath, breathing out, allowing the breath to be something simple like that. Or you could even be as simple as in, out. Sometimes having a meditation word that corresponds to what the mind is knowing can be helpful. But if you don't need that meditation word or phrase, then just do the practice silently. And again, always willing to begin again and again. This is the training. And when you notice distraction, especially repeated patterns of distraction, then just acknowledge it in a friendly way. Oh, the mind is thinking about this again. It feels like this. It's just this experience that's being known this tendency of the mind being known. And we let the distraction cease on its own. And then we start over again. We feel the body sitting. We notice the next breath in or out. And we practice bringing this full and relaxed attention to the ordinary phenomena of breathing in and breathing out.
And now we can begin to open up the practice. Um, so the next instruction might be just noticing the experience of the whole body as you're breathing in and experiencing the whole body as you breathe out. So if you wanna use a little meditation phrase or word, it could be something like breathing in, experiencing the whole body, breathing out, allowing the body to be. So obviously we're still aware of breathing in and breathing out, but now the field of awareness is inclusive of the whole body, the physicality of the whole body. Nothing is left out. Breathing in, experiencing the whole body. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body. And you can let everything else just be there, but in the background and doing our best, we keep bringing our attention, breathing in, experiencing the whole body, just as it is. Breathing out, experiencing the whole body, just as it is. And again, when you notice distraction in a friendly way, just acknowledge that tendency of the mind to think about this or that, whatever it is. Sense what the underlying feeling is with the distractedness. 
Is there an underlying charge or whatever? And when you're aware of the distraction, notice how it ceases on its own. Just watching, notice it goes away. And then coming back to the body. And the next step would be breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the body. So as you're breathing in and feeling the whole body, notice, pay attention to the sense of calm in the body. It might initially be just one place in the body that feels really settled or calm. And notice that as you're breathing in, as you're breathing out. So the phrase you could repeat if that's useful for you is, Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the body. We're just repeating the word calm with each breath and out breath. So we're choosing to be aware of just this one thing again, experiencing the calm in the body as we breathe in, sensing any calm in the body as we breathe out. Of course, there will be other experiences, but keeping the calm in the body in mind through the in-breath, through the out-breath, just doing the best we can. We can't make 
the body calm, but we can notice the calming, even if initially it's quite faint or subtle. So with, to whatever degree the body feels settled and calm, then we keep that in mind as we breathe in and we keep the calm in the body and mind as we breathe out. And the next instruction we take up is breathing in, experiencing joy. Breathing out, experiencing joy. And it's okay to have some humility. It's good to be bringing a fresh sense of what joy can be. The simple lightness or simple brightness of the heart and mind, like a buoyancy. And again, it might be quite faint or relatively subtle, but simply through the duration of breathing in, train the mind to be interested in joy, however subtle it might be right now. And then through that time it takes to breathe out, just being curious and open to the experience of joy that's here and now. Just a little lightness of the heart or brightness in the mind. Keeping joy in mind as you breathe in. Keeping joy in mind as you breathe out. And once again, just do the best you can. Let that be good enough. Enjoy. At some point, we'll naturally mature into a more resonant ease of the heart, the ease of contentedness, or this it's almost like an energetic relaxation of the heart. But you can just call it happiness, but a real visceral sense of happiness. Again, it might be quite faint. Breathing in, experiencing this ease of the heart. Breathing out, experiencing this ease of the heart. And just see if you can keep, however faint, this, 
sense of ease as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Keeping ease in mind as we breathe in, doing our best to keep ease in mind as we breathe out. This is the ease of well-being, ease of being settled, and that good feeling of ease makes the mind more and more dispassionate, less caught up in thoughts about this and that, and that allows the thinking to begin to quiet down more. So you can just notice this dispassion as you breathe in and out and the quieting of the thinking mind. Breathing in, experiencing the quietness, the relative quietness of the mind. Breathing out, experiencing the relative the of the mind. And finally, we just notice the space of the present moment. Breathing in, noticing the space, open space of the mind at the moment. Breathing out, noticing the wide open space. Breathing in, appreciating the space, the silent, open space of the knowing mind here and now. And breathing out, just trusting or abiding in the space of the present moment. Noticing the peace as you breathe in Noticing the peace as you breathe out, the beautiful stillness as you breathe in, stillness as you breathe out.
And in a very gradual way, you can keep hold, holding the body relatively still, but allow the eyes to open if they've been closed. And just sensing that sense of space and stillness and peace or whatever it is that's here and now. And then begin to move your body, stretch a little, but start slowly. You don't need to make any fast or big moves. Whatever you need to do to release any tension that might have developed. So it really matters what we pay attention to. And so the nice thing about the set of instructions that we use tonight is it follows um, you know, a wise path. So first we took care of the mind, which is mostly superficial, attending to this and that, our problems, our hopes, all of that. And we said, honey, let's just be with something ordinary. Let's let everything else fall into the background. And we're just going to be attentive to something ordinary. And remember, it could be anything, but tonight we used the physicality of breathing in or out. Because it's a nice thing. The nice thing about the breath as one of our primary anchors, meditation anchors, is it has movement to it. So it's more interesting than just touch points, sensation, right? Because it's dynamic in that way. And there's another aspect to the breath that makes it a particularly good meditation object, which is as your body and mind becomes more settled, more concentrated, what happens to the breath? It becomes more subtle. And so it's like a beautiful natural feedback system because Awareness has to be more attentive, more receptive, because the breath is getting more subtle as things settle down. So it builds. And then as the mind gathers, it collects the energy to attend to something that's becoming more subtle. Then it itself, right? The mind itself is becoming subtle to be aware of something that's subtle. So it really reinforces. And that's why, you know, being aware of the whole body, then there's a kind of healing where the mind that knows is knowing the body. And it's like a good friend. If I give my attention to my friend 100%, or if you, some of you maybe are parents and you like really show up for your kid, you're just all there, even though they're doing something that's not that interesting to you, building with blocks or whatever, you know, which you've done hundreds of times, but you're just like really there. Heart is all in. Well, the child, the friend, they know that, what do they do? They go, oh, I belong, I'm being loved. And that's what happens to the body when we have that full, unwavering, kind, non-judging presence with the breath and then with the whole body, the body begins to feel better. It begins to relax. It begins to feel some calm. And then that awareness, that wise awareness notices the calm, which is a kind of amplification of that goodness. And it causes the calm to spread. And when there's enough of that bodily calm, that healing of the mind, knowing the body, then the mind, the heart starts to feel some joy. Ah, ah, I feel better. That's that lightness of heart we call joy. Can we keep that in mind? If we do keep it in mind, the joy in mind, the heart begins to relax in a more <clears throat> resonant <clears throat> way. We call that ease of the heart. It's a kind of more, um, a more grounded happiness, as if the heart is 
releasing tension you didn't realize it was holding. Ah, that feels good. Ease of heart, ease of well-being, it feels good. And when we really notice that, how good it feels when we're breathing in and breathing out that ease, then the mind becomes more dispassionate. It's not neurotically trying to feel good because it already feels good. And because it's not neurotically trying to feel good, the thinking mind, that activity of the mind starts to quiet down. The mind gets quieter. Still activity, still thoughts, mental images, but there's more dispassion. Like, like we don't feel so pushed around by thoughts and feelings and other mental activities. It's just like birds chirping, you know, it's sound, it's something. Something's going on in the thinking mind, but it's not a big deal. That's the dispassion. And that allows for the quieting. And the more the thinking mind, the activity mind quiets down, the more something that's always here, but subtle, the space, the silent, open, knowing space becomes more obvious. And so we notice that, we appreciate that, and we learn to abide in the peace, the silence, the stillness of that. And we're still more to do, but that's the basic trajectory of having a so-called good set. Now, the whole point of that isn't that it's so healing, it feels so good, because it is emotionally healing, psychologically, even spiritual healing. But the real value of that trajectory of going from an ordinary, distracted, superficial, dissipated mind to really gathered, present, healed, and whole part mind is that that mind will see what we're currently not seeing about the nature of things. And in particular, the nature of how we get involved in states of stress and suffering and how that can all be avoided, right? Because that mind sees clearly precisely because it's so settled, precisely because it's not neurotically trying to control things, it can really see things clearly. It's not so neurotically involved in the push and pull. It has a sense of space. So this gives it a kind of uh, accuracy and precision and breadth that really sees, oh, this is how the mind takes the bait, gets attached, begins to react. But when I see those negative or unhelpful patterns, but my mind is partially caught up in it, we don't really see clearly. I mean, we kind of know we get attached, we kind of know we react, but we, if we really see it clearly, it's like noticing you're holding a really hot pan. You just let go. You don't need to like have that. It's not a strat. You don't need a strategy. You just need to know you're holding something that's really hot and you don't need to be holding it and you let go. And that's what happens when the mind is in this really subtle, profoundly subtle, peaceful, spacious place. And then the mind, because of the force of habit, starts to do something neurotic. Wisdom just goes, don't need to do that. It just lets go. And it isn't you saying, oh, Mark, you should let go here. No, no, letting go just happens because it, the unhelpfulness is so obvious to the mind because of the contrast. When the mind is spacious and still and clear, it just notices what's unskillful and like in living vibrant color. Oh, this isn't helpful. And the letting go just comes from that scene. So it's always nice, as I always say, to hear from folks. Um, I mentioned the last few weeks to make a mental note of any kind of learning, any kind of challenging experiences that came up in walking meditation or sitting meditation, any questions that are emerging about your practice or about Buddhism that you want to ask. Because we all learn from people just their willingness to share what you're learning or any questions that you have. So here in the room or online, you can 
uh, raise your digital hand. If you don't know how to do that, you can simply unmute yourself. Um, but yeah, who'd like to go first? Anybody? Yeah, please. And if you don't mind standing here and speaking into the mic, that makes it easy for the people online to hear you. Yeah, I can. Okay, thanks. I love the 20, 30 minutes that I put aside because it's forcing me to detach from the distractions and it gets to the root of why I want to be distracted. Because if I don't sit in the emotion or if I don't sit in this calm place or safe place, then I can't figure out why I was trying to distract myself in the first place. And then I can get to the root of the problem. And it's been very helpful. And that's what I mean, just what you said. That's what I mean about seeing what we haven't seen. Because <clears throat> it's not quite accurate to say that we let go of these neurotic patterns. What we do is we see it. That's that breath, that present moment awareness, mindful awareness brings. It's not just the depth, like seeing into the subtlety of what's here and now. It's also the tracking, that continuity where we see like how it is that the mind's entangled in this way. Oh, there was this painful emotion. I guess the mind didn't want to feel it. It generated some thoughts. The thoughts led to more thoughts, the feeling, you know, and then, then there was some sort of, and we see the whole thing. The mind sees it for what it is. It's nature. It's not really that personal. I'm not even doing it. It's just like cause and effect playing itself out. But it's not a, even that we have to cognitively tell ourselves what it is. We don't. We just have to see it clearly and then it can be dropped. And that's a really nice example because it's like a testimonial when people share how they saw something, they had that breadth and depth and the natural result was the disentanglement or the letting go or what was heavy is no longer so heavy. And that's a little taste of the freedom that the Buddhist teachings and practices lead to, or just, you know, mindful awareness is a liberating practice. In a sense, it's guaranteed, but no one can do it for us. We got to do it for ourselves. We got to, like you said, you got to put that time in because initially it's not going to happen in daily life. There's just too many triggers. But if we do put the time into the formal meditation, then we'll start to learn how to keep it going. It will be feeble a lot of the day, but we're going to learn how to keep it going more and more of the day. And the whole point is to do it all day long, not just the 20 minutes or the 15 minutes or the 30 minutes that we set aside. Okay, Natalie, you wanted to go next. It'd be nice to hear from you. Okay. Mark, I wonder if you could comment on a posture uh, thing that I've learned from yoga and, um, and it's with the hands. And one of the things that I learned in yoga is that when we start and we have, you know, a stillness and a relaxing is that many of the teachers will say, if you're anxious, if you're nervous, um, you're too busy or distracted, keep your hands down, ground your hands into the floor or your mat. And if you're needing energy, you're feeling kind of depressed, you want to be light, have your hands up to be filled from, you know, wherever. What do you think of that? Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Well, I mean, <clears throat> Life and Buddhism and the practice is really pragmatic. And whether you draw from some of these ancient traditions like yoga, or you just draw from trial and error, like what helps, like just in terms of posture, what helps to settle the mind? What posture is useful? Now you can, we can get neurotic about that, can't we? you know, because we're trying to fit some image or we read something in a book. So it's, it's really great when information comes, check it out. If it seems to be helpful, use it. But don't get, ultimately, you don't, 
the external doesn't matter nearly as much as the internal. Like Jen asked earlier, if you might remember, Jen asked about intention. And in this work, subtle is more significant than gross. So like what we do with our hands matters, but it's relatively gross. Intention, the intention and the quality of the motivation is relatively subtle and it's much more important, but it's subtle. So it's a little harder to work with. So like sometimes when we put our hands on the mat, you know, it may be less about the hands on the mat, but what the teacher said that it connects us with the earth and that reminds us to be grounded and it reconnects us with a more subtle intention like don't get so caught up in thoughts about stuff, just be in the here and now, right? So that it may be more about that intention about being grounded or rooted in the present moment than actually having the hands connecting with the floor or the earth. Because that's, you know, and, and I know this sounds a little trippy to say it this way, but we are living in the mind. Our reality is the mind. There may be, you know, an external reality, but all I know is what my mind is knowing here and now. I only know my mind. You only know your mind. So what's happening in the mind is really relevant the way the mind is understanding the mind or the way the mind is understanding the experience that's being known in the mind, that matters. The way the mind is relating relationship, it's all relational. How is the mind relating? With what intention? Is my intention, you know, like when we're in an irritable mood, my intention is sort of like destroy, <laughs> boom, boom you know, just wanting to, or when we're like stars in our eyes or seeing through rose tinted, you know, everything's beautiful. It's like these things matter, the kind of quality that the mind is relating through. So can we notice that? Well, it's subtle. It's like learning to notice intention, that's subtle, but that's where we're going with the practice. Yeah, thanks Natalie for sharing that. Thank you. Other folks, we have some more time. But uh, yeah, please, you want to, do you mind standing up so that everyone can hear you? Yeah, if you don't mind. Allow the people online to hear you. Um. I feel like I'm really close to something or I felt like I, I kind of comes and goes and it's right there. And then I hear what you're saying about dropping the hot pot. But um, my experience, um, when I think back, um, the, when I've tried to have, when I've tried to be in the moment, I start to feel like uh, I'm going insane or something. and um, I've been diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, and now it, and so it's really hard for me to, tr to, tr to trust, um, to open to a moment, to open to joy. It's, it's hard to know what, it's hard to know what isn't, isn't safe. And, um, and it, it hurts to not be able to let go because it's so close. I can I can feel it at moments like I'm right, like I'm talking or looking at God or something incredible, and then and then all of a sudden my mind just starts ticking and saying, "Oh, you can't, don't let go of this," or everything's gonna you're gonna you're gonna end up back in the hospital. And I spent a lot of time in the hospital, and I feel like there are people who who don't want me to have. It seems like they don't want they don't want me to get out of the labyrinth, but I really, I mean, I I, I would I really would like to. So I'm just kind of trying to know what to trust and how to go forward. Yeah, I appreciate your comments, and uh, you know I'm not a mental health expert, and uh, but I can talk about the mind, and then you have to do your own sort of bringing it into the to the issues that you're working with. 
But what I said earlier about the different postures, you know, all of our minds are different. And uh, whether we talk about it in terms of biochemistry or we just talk about it in terms of the tendencies of our different minds, but they're not all the same, just the conditioning, the tendencies, the biochemistry. And we have to work with the mind that we have, right? And, and we'll learn, just like you're learning, you have to learn like, uh, um, like with this practice, we don't need to force anything. And, and generally, the best learning happens when there's enough safety. And so this style that we get from early Buddhism, you know, it doesn't use, when you look at the human history of spiritual technology and Sundance, like in the indigenous uh, people here in the United States, a really intense pro process, or sweats, or drumming, or chanting, or, you know, there's so many powerful spiritual practices, the use of plant medicines, hallucinogens, things like that. But what the Buddha came to over the course of his years of teaching after his own awakening is to use something really gentle. And I, I think of the soft power of present moment awareness. It's a really soft power. And some of you might remember if you've ever read the Tao Te Ching, this collection of teachings that's sort of the foundation of Taoism in China. It's an ancient spiritual system if you don't know about it. It's beautiful. And uh, one of the things that says in that collection of teachings is how water is the most powerful thing. Like the fact that water carved the Grand Canyon. I don't know if anybody's seen the Grand Canyon, but it's pretty amazing that something as pliable as water can cut a groove a mile deep into the earth through solid rock. That's impressive. And so to have that sort of sense, like, I don't need to hurry. I don't need to rush because greed, that's a spiritual greed. Greed isn't the cause for opening. Safety and wholesome intentions, like just wanting to be real, just wanting to be grounded. So one thing that might make sense is instead of the stillness of sitting, you might practice doing more walking and using a more kind of whole body approach to cultivating mindfulness, like rotating through seeing, hearing, and feeling the body. So if you're just, you know, walking along the river, for example, or whatever it might be, even just doing loops around the block for your meditation time, but just rotate. So you're walking for 30 seconds to a minute, and you're just cultivating an awareness of seeing. You're not looking around, but you're just aware that seeing is being known. And that could be even what you say to you, okay, seeing is being known. Seeing is being known. And then after 30 seconds, 10 minutes, switch to hearing and just open to that sense gate. Hearing is being known. And this is good. This is a great practice for anybody, of course. And then the third would be to go to the physicality of walking, you know, sensations are being felt, physicality of walking is being known, something like that. And then back to seeing, back to hearing, back to walking. And just because whatever it is, like you mentioned, like heaven is just a fraction of an inch away or something like that. Whatever spiritual goal, mystical experience is available, where is it? It's here and now. If it's really of value, it's here and now. It's always been here and now. It will always be here and now. You see, so greed is never going to help because it's already here and now. What helps is that trusting like of that uh, awareness. It's here. We don't have to force. We have to relax and, op and let that, that opening, that connecting is, is sort of built in. What gets in the way is any kind of neurotic fear, neurotic doing, neurotic greed, neurotic doubting, anything that keeps us from being open. 
Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, if it were easy, there'd be a lot of wise, kind, enlightened beings floating around. I don't see them. Because the web of neurotic greed, hatred, and delusion is how we describe it in Buddhism. You know, those tendencies to be greedy, to feel like, if only, then I'd be happy. That's a pretty chronic habit in our conditioning. And the, the, the habit of fear, the habit of reactivity. So just like using walking, sitting, lying down, standing, but we're really learning how to be real in a relaxed, open, clear way. Not forcing it. The self doesn't go away. What changes is how we understand like that part of my mind that, you know, locates a sense of me here and a sense of you there, that that's just the thinking mind. I mean, it's an aspect of the thinking mind, but what happens is there's a deepening of understanding that's not confused by what language does to experience because we're not orienting around that, co- that level of cognition or thought. It's just used as a tool. Thoughts are a really useful tool. We don't need to get rid of thoughts, but thoughts can be very confusing. So when you feel the need to define or describe the truth, the mystical truth, the underlying truth, it's always a dead end. The Buddha said, no matter how you describe it, no matter how you conceptualize it, the truth will always be other than that because it isn't conceptual. It doesn't need to be told to ourselves or anybody else. And when you look at the teachings of the Buddha, not so much the later Buddhist traditions, but especially, you know, things that are related to this human being, he wasn't so interested in talking about mystical truth or the underlying truth. He was just interested in creating a practice, which is basically opening using present moment awareness to connect and not worried about what that leads to. Cause that's just a thought about that's we're making stuff up, right? So it's really much more earthy than that. Well, we are almost out of time. Next week is week four. I'll be here next week, but then Shelly Graff will do the last two weeks, week five, week six. Remember, and I know it's not easy. We're all busy have lots going on, but as much as possible, give yourself these six weeks. Don't worry if you have to miss because someone in your family's sick or you have a business thing or whatever. We're recording them and sending them out in the weekly emails, reminding you about the class. So the email you got this afternoon had the recordings for week one and two. We're recording tonight and there'll be time. And uh, Travis, can you hold your question to next week? Is that okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't forget it. I want to use it. And feel free, you can even email it to me, and then I'll talk about it right at the beginning of class for week four. Oh, thank you. That would be great. I appreciate that. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Hope to see you next Tuesday night in person or online. And, uh, yeah, have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.